Rhoda. Good, good, Susan. Great turnout. Um, okay, well, let's get started. Uh, and thank you all so much uh, for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Shaker Krishnan, uh, and I'm running for city council here in Elmhurst and Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, and I'm so excited to see uh, so many of you joining tonight, too, for such a critical discussion um, in our communities as well, and frankly, in New York City and across our country, too. Uh, but it is, without a doubt, we all know this, that climate justice is one of the most, and our climate, is one of the most urgent crises that we face right now uh, on a global level. And here in New York City, it is critical that we are a fully renewable city by 2030. So much has been wasted in terms of uh, uh, climate uh, uh, measures around uh, small changes here and there to repair a system that fundamentally needs to change structurally and entirely, but we're actually prioritizing clean, renewable energy. We're actually investing, most importantly, in low-income communities of color that have been disinvested in and affected by environmental racism for decades now. It's no secret that some of the poorest communities in the city uh, are the same ones that are suffering from uh, high rates of environmental damage, uh, polluter plants uh, and other incinerators being placed in their neighborhoods. And as a result of that major public health issues, as a result of all the toxins being released in the air too. We're also facing a city that's been dominated by luxury real estate development for years, that's been destroying our coastlines that have not prepared us well uh, for um, any climate crisis in our city too. There's so much we need to do to really rebuild our city, but in doing so, center the environment too. And in doing that, support the communities that have been most damaged by environmental racism and environmental injustice for decades now. That's why I'm so excited today to have a panel of incredible organizers and activists who are doing so much work in our city around these issues. Uh, and I think that today will be a discussion really uh, about exactly what can we do as New York City uh, to make sure that we are fighting for our environment, for our climate, uh, and centering the communities that need the most support and resources too. So I wanna start out uh, by just introducing each of our panelists before we open it up for a discussion and then questions as well. Uh, I'm so pleased that we're joined uh, by Melanie LaRosa, who's also a Jackson Heights resident. Uh, Melanie is an award-winning filmmaker, an experienced producer, and a dedicated educator, and also a assistant professor as well. And Melanie's documentaries have focused on so many different social justice stories uh, that have received critical acclaim from uh, finishing now how to power a city that should be released this year, um, to so many other uh, issues of climate uh, crises and justice in our city as well. Uh, so we're so excited to have Melanie here too, to talk about these issues and in particular touch on some of the topics affecting us here when it comes to clean energy uh, and public power in our city too. I'm so excited as well to be joined by uh, Jamie Tyberg too. Uh, and Jamie, uh, I'm pulling up the bio right now, Jamie, uh, is a Brooklyn-based movement fundraiser uh, and climate activist originally from Korea. Uh, and Jamie is the director of the uh, development at New York Communities for Change, a grassroots organization of low-income members of color fighting against racial oppression and economic injustice. Uh, Melanie uh, helped co-found an after-school club at the High School for Environmental Studies dedicated to developing young climate justice organizers, and she serves on the steering committee of, pub of the Public Bank Coalition and volunteers on national and local anti-imperialist abolitionist campaigns. Uh, Melanie, uh, sorry, guys said Melanie, Jamie, sorry, uh, is an incredible uh, organizer uh, in our city too, uh, and a huge part of the uh, uh, climate movement as well. Thank you, Jamie, we're so excited to have you with us. Um, and finally, uh, my brother Arif Ulatu, who's also a Jackson Heights resident and great activist too. Arif is a Jackson Heights-based environmental and social justice activist he designs and leads programs that provide capacity building support to grassroots groups and facilitates the power of such groups to become organizers and advocates uh, for their community's needs. Arif is a co-founder of Bangladeshi Americans for Political Progress uh, and a core member of Queens Climate Project. He also started the Malcolm X Community Garden in Corona, Queens, where he grows food and keeps honeybees. Uh, and I've tasted the honey uh, from that farm as well, uh, our community garden as well. So I know it's really good and really respect all the work that you do too. So Melanie, Jamie, Arif, thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, I'll just start out in, there's a lot we wanna get to, but let's start out with uh, the most uh, basic question uh, that maybe we, each of you can kind of give a little bit of a statement about. Uh, why, what is the most 
urgent? Why is the climate crisis so urgent in New York City right now? Uh, and what are the challenges that we face in really fighting for our climate in New York? We know it's a global crisis. We know the issues we face in our country, but here in New York City, it's urgent too. And I'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts from each of you about what is so urgent about this crisis uh, and what are, what are the challenges that we're facing in addressing it as a city? Uh, maybe Jamie, we'll start with you first. Sure, um, was not expecting to go first, but- <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Jamie. <laughs> Yeah, excited to be here. Sorry, just my books just fell. Yeah, I would just say, you know, the climate crisis is the field on which all of our other crises are taking place. Um, it affects all aspects of life, um, you know, very much including housing, um, transportation, um, access to education and healthcare. And I think the COVID-19 crisis has also really highlighted this. Um, there's actually a really good piece on Monthly Review magazine tracing the roots of COVID-19 and how, you know, as our climate becomes more and more unstable, we're going to see more of these, you know, global massive pandemics and extreme weather events and it is extremely urgent here in New York because not only are we a coastal city, but we're also one of the biggest economies in the world. We're also one of the most populated areas of the world. Um, whatever happens will just multiply here and impact so many people here. And so much of what makes this country what it is. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of work at our hands. I I think I agree with you entirely, Jamie, the way you phrased it too, like how the climate crisis um, is such a central crisis upon which every other one uh, is built in our city too. And I want to focus on that more in the course of our discussion too. But uh, Melanie, I would love to hear a few thoughts from you too, from your perspective. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, as Shaker mentioned, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, and and my, uh, the documentary I'm working on right now is um, that I'm finishing. I followed people installing solar and wind uh, and other types of clean energy projects, mostly solar and wind, in six locations around the U.S. One of them was New York City. Um, when I was looking for uh, people to talk to here, uh, Long story short, I ended up talking to the city council member from Astoria, Costa Constantinides, who some of you may know his name, um, who is a widely acknowledged leader in like getting clean energy into the city. Um, and, you know, you can talk about climate justice and, and that's really important. And the other side of it, as you see behind me, is solar panels or clean energy that we all know it contributes to the climate crisis. So. Um, you know, I feel like in response to your question, Shaker, like the most important thing right now is, is honestly just to realize the opportunities that we have and be able to do something because in the midst of all the, the bad news and the, the crises and the oppressions and the difficult things, which are really, you know, all linked together, there's a ton of opportunity. Um, and so the gist of this film is that like, I originally started out just thinking, I want to find people who are doing this somehow, somewhere, and just sort of look at how. So the film's called How to Power a City. It ended up looking at disasters, you know, grid rebuilding, which when I started this, people would look at me and they're like, who wants to talk about the grid? Well, right now, Texas, Puerto Rico, California, New York, all want to talk about the grid because all had major grid failures. So at the very least, we all know that word. Um, but you know, the, it just ended up being about so much more. And I thought I was going to make this little film about science and technology. It turned into this great big thing about the grid and sort of clean energy infrastructure. But there's some huge opportunities um, that, are, that are happening. And actually, um, in terms of what like a city council member could do, uh, council member Constantinides led a, an initiative. Um, there's many, 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 many people who were involved and it took years but it ultimately just passed the city council to turn um, Rikers Island into a solar farm when they closed the prison, um, which is amazing. And there's a very, and you might think that's not gonna make enough energy, but there's a very specific piece of like our energy mix that it could uh, take care of and replace, which would 
drastically reduce the amount of pollution that we breathe, you know, especially in Astoria, but all throughout Queens. And as you're saying, um, Jamie, it affects communities of color, low income communities the most. So I think sometimes these opportunities just get lost in the midst of other things because there's so much to know about them. So, um, you know, I, I feel like one of the most important things we could do is just start to inform ourselves about the little, little but big steps we can take. Absolutely. And I'm glad you also tied it to, and we'll, we'll focus a bit on, on it as well, but about, you know, what's happened in Texas and other um, uh, crises around our, our country too, and here in New York City as well. Um, are you, what, what, what is your perspective? And I know one thing just to touch on too, as part of that, uh, in thinking about the crisis in this city, and Jamie kind of mentioned as well, and so did Melanie too, but let's talk about, when you think about what is so urgent about the climate crisis in New York, how does it tie to environmental racism uh, and low-income communities of color. Um, I know you've done a lot of work around those issues as well. So I'd love for you to speak on that as well and kind of framing what it is that we're facing as a city when it comes to our climate policies. Oh, you're on mute, Arif. Great, thank you. Um, it's, it's an honor to be um, on this panel. Um, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Jamie. I agree with everything that um, you've said. I really like the way you put it, Jamie, in terms of climate change being the field on which all of the issues um, that we're working on really, you know, grows from. Um, and so in terms of folks of color, I mean, let's face it, folks of color, folks from low-income uh, backgrounds are always on, at the front lines of the worst things, right? Whether that's war, economic crises, and climate change. I'm from Bangladesh. I, I, I was born there, migrated here at a young age. And, you know, that is a country that is on the front lines of climate change. It's slowly disappearing. Um, so bringing it back to New York City though, uh, in relating it to folks of color here, um, we don't have to look any further than the location of, for example, waste transfer stations, of uh, peaker plants, of uh, warehouses with constant traffic, of bus depots, um, you know, or where, you know, a uh, fresh direct factory is located in the South Bronx, you know, constant traffic to know the reality of environmental racism. You know, why are these facilities, facilities located in places like the South Bronx, in places like East Harlem, or next to public housing developments in Queens and not on the Upper East Side? Um, obviously, you know, the poor air quality um, and its associated health conditions like asthma um, are directly linked to environmental racism. And, and that's why environmental justice is, is so much a racial justice issue. Um, and of course the, the component of jobs. So when we're talking about um, converting and, and, and transitioning into a uh, renewable, renewable economy, um, jobs are a huge part of that. Um, all of the green jobs that would be created um, you know, to build the offshore uh, wind turbines, to install the solar panels and, and so much more. Um, we need to have a, a workforce that's ready to be able to do those jobs. And I think it's critical that those people who are at the front lines of um, climate change, um, those who are experiencing the brunt of climate change are the ones who are um, invested in. Those are the communities that um, receive the job training programs, that receive the support um, needed to be able to really um, fill these jobs and make sure that um, their needs are are met. So um, that's that's. I'll stop there. Um, but you know, if you have any follow up questions, I'm happy to answer. Sure. And I and I really like how you've mentioned to the Green New Deal, for example, and a just transition. What that means for New York City. Um, and you know, I would also encourage people as well. Uh, throughout this presentation or even afterwards to check out our climate justice platform on our website, um, www.voteshaker.com, which addresses a lot of these issues that we're gonna be hitting on uh, today too. Um, but, you know, I, I think you, you made a, a couple of really good points about whether it's a just transition and a Green New Deal, tying it to the workforce and how we think about that, to also making New York City a renewable city by 2030, right? That's a very critical, but also uh, ambitious goal that we need to hit. And so many things we need to do to achieve it. So one of those things, uh, Melanie, I wanted to go back to you. Um, you mentioned Texas and you mentioned um, clean energy. And a big part of that is our power sources in our city too, right? It's not just a problem in Texas. We saw it a problem there, but also here in New York City when we've had blackouts, one, we've had multiple ones, but every time it happens, you'll notice 
that they affect so much more disproportionately communities, for example, in Jamaica, Queens, than they will in, you know, Upper East Side of Manhattan, right? So public power, I think, is such an essential part of making us a renewable city. And I was wondering if you could talk to that a bit. Why is public power so important? What is the problem with the system now when we're relying on private entities to deliver power? Uh, and what is that impact does that have on our power grid? Okay, I am really going to try to keep a short answer, but you asked one of those big questions that can <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It could okay. be going on and on. But because um, there's a lot, there's a lot of answer to that question. Um, the short answer is most power generation is made by a corporation. It doesn't matter if it, a corporation makes shoes or they make electricity, their bottom line is to make a profit. Okay. So the vast majority, well, I shouldn't say that it's not the vast majority because there are municipally owned, which I think is what you mean by public power, like municipal municipalities that own power generation, but most of it is, is made by corporations. Okay. So a corporation and I'm, I, I try in, in my film, uh, I made a point that I did not try to villainize corporations. I was trying to look at how. So, and I told this to every, I interviewed like 33 people, every single one of them I said, this is not about like villainizing. It's not about victimizing. This is about looking at how and what we can change and what is working, right? So um, some of those corporations are investing in their grids and some of them are investing in updating their power generation. Um, one of the locations I filmed in was in Nevada. It's like, duh, of course they're gonna use a lot of solar, right? But the, the utility there um, was invested a lot of money and they got other people to invest it. And they don't have the same kind of um, natural disasters, I think in Nevada that maybe, but you know, I don't think Texas expected a blizzard either. So um, other utilities, and I'm not gonna try, try not to name names here, um, <laughs> do not invest so much. You know, I, I filmed a lot in a town called Highland Park, which is inside the Detroit city limits. And they have blackout after blackout after blackout. And it's always because trees hit wires and wires fall down. It's not some huge technical reason, right? But be, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a corporation and your bottom line is to, to make the most money and, and not just your bottom line, but your commitment to your, your shareholders, you have to legally make the most money. Um, that's almost what you have to do is, you know, cut down on maintenance and try to make more profit and blah, blah, blah. Well, so then somebody might say, well, well, it has to be that way. We can't just like get rid of, you know, however, that's not true. Okay. So I filmed also another location in Vermont with a utility. It's called Green Mountain Power. Four years in a row, Fast Company Magazine has called it the most innovative utility in the United States. And they are number one in the country for integrating clean power. They are a privately owned company. They're not, they're not publicly owned, uh, but they are, they are B Corporation. So their current CEO, uh, Mary Powell, she recertified it as a B Corp, which means their bottom line is technically different. They get to have a socially relevant bottom line. That's what a B Corporation is. It's like Ben and Jerry's is a B Corporation. Okay, and they are the first, and, and she said she still thinks they're the only utility in the country that has become a B Corporation. So there are ways, and they have an amazing amount of uh, solar power. They have integrated wind power, and the wind farms, when they're located near a town, that town gets money from the wind farms, uh, and it cuts down everybody's property taxes. Wow. Like, they have just created a lot of win-win-win situations. Um so I really wanted to profile, you know, here's a utility that is a private company that is actually doing something that is, you know, helping sort of all of the things move forward, right? Public owned power um, in New York state, we, uh, you know, like most of the power generated here, the five power plants, if you go to Astoria, they're all owned by private companies. Um, however, we still have choices here in New York. Uh, and one thing I wanted to mention, and I really hope this doesn't put you all to sleep because <laughs> it's so technical and like wonky, but it's called community choice aggregation. There's a handful of states in the country that can do this, but it means a community can come together and say, we don't want to buy power from that, you know, natural gas power plant or whatever. We want to buy it from this place. And so certain communities like in Westchester, uh, I happen to teach at a university in Westchester, um, some of those towns have signed up for community choice aggregation. Like I know Poughkeepsie has as well, like a few other towns. Um, 
and and at one point I started asking like, well, how do you do this in New York City? Could you do it as like Jackson Heights or do you have to be an official town? I couldn't get a lot of answers for it, but I think that is the kind of thing like a city council and a mayor, like that's because it is, you know, sort of, you have to have some kind of a community establishment. Um, some places do it. I've heard of places doing it as like houses of worship can do it and they can, you know, so there are different arrangements that, that are state-based, um, that in New York State happens to be, in New York, California, a handful of other states are, have a lot of options for consumers. Um, the other, so that is a public option, right? If you can't just transition and go through whatever has to happen to transition right. all of the corporate structures, right? The last thing I wanted to mention, this is really important because you could literally do it like tomorrow, right? Uh, because of some of these options in New York, you can do something called community solar. Uh, which means that um, we all can't just, you know, go and put it on our, our roof because we don't all own our own homes, right? Even if, even if you own your apartment, um, you still have a co-op board. And if you don't own your apartment and you rent, you got like, you're like, I can't do anything to the building, right? But there's community solar, which means all of these like rooftops and warehouses um, around there. The, the, the place that I filmed with was mostly in Maspeth, Yonkers, Mount Vernon. Um, and when I started, they had like four sites on their website. I filmed with them a couple of years ago. And by the end, like six months later, I checked back and they had like 10. And I just checked back like a month ago. And now they've got like 45 sites, okay, where these are warehouses. Um, and it's not actually what's behind me. This is a uh, Borough Manhattan Community College. Uh, but these are warehouses where the warehouse owner just says you can, you know, they rent the rooftop, a, a solar company comes in, installs the solar panels, and we can buy them through our Con Ed bill. It stays with you. You could move, you can be a renter, you can be a homeowner, but it's like another option that because of the way the regulations are in New York State, we can do that. Um, so this is what I meant by opportunities. We could actually take, it, this feels like a little small action, like we did it, my partner and I, and it's like, okay, we did that. Now we have a solar powered apartment, like everything's exactly the same as it was the day before, except I feel better about it and I can talk about it, <laughs> but you don't notice anything. Um, and the company I signed up with, you don't get charged more. The company I signed up with says they guarantee it's like 5% below the rate that Con Ed would, would have. So, um, you know, some of these different options, like I think people feel like it has to be everything changes and that gets really overwhelming. And at least in New York, this isn't true everywhere. But there are ways you can take individual actions, um, you know, so I guess that's part of what I hope to accomplish as a filmmaker and I hope to accomplish by talking to people such as yourselves and, you know, we can all start doing these little things. One person tells one person, word of mouth and keep it going. Um, thank you for mentioning that too, Monica, because I do think it's important to know what are ways that we can, you know, um, in our steps that we can take now to address what sometimes is like a daunting crisis and where do we start? Um, that's a great uh, uh, point that you mentioned. I'm glad that you mentioned that program too. Um, Arif, I wanna shift it to you for, for a minute. Yeah, you talked a bit of before talking about, you know, clean energy and public power and the importance of not relying on private for corporate, uh, for-profit corporations um, that don't have our interests in mind. There's the Peaker plans in Astoria that you mentioned before too. Um, and I wanted to kind of take the discussion more locally to talk about what are things that we can do here in Jackson Heights and in Elmhurst? So what are the, some of the climate issues that we should get involved with here? Um, the Peaker Plants and Astoria are a part of that. So maybe you can kind of touch on that and also talk about what are some community issues here that we can think about that connect up with the larger citywide movement as well. Yeah, thanks, Shekhar. Um, so on the topic of Peaker Plants, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Peaker Plants, these are basically the dirtiest energy plants in the city. Um, they are called peaker plants because um, they are uh, activated during the um, moments of like very, very peak demand. So, um, you know, th the hottest days in the summer and they burn the dirtiest energy. Um, and uh, New York City pays uh, a huge amount of money to just keep them active, even when they're not producing um, any energy. And so there are uh, 18 of them uh, throughout the city. Six of them are in Queens and three in Astoria alone. Um, and uh, in fact, Queens Climate Project, uh, the group that I'm, that I'm active in, we're part of a larger campaign um, to uh, stop a power company called NRG located in an Astoria power plant um, on the Con Ed campus um, in Dit on Dittmar's Boulevard. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, they are looking to replace their um, aging facilities with new 
fossil fuel infrastructure, which is mind boggling um, given you know, where, where we are right now and flies in the face of the goals of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which um, as you might know, uh, is the historic bill that was passed by the New York State Legislature in 2019 and which calls for 70% uh, of electricity to come from renewable sources by 2030 and for net zero greenhouse gas emissions from electricity by 2040. So that NRG would be looking to um, bring in new fossil fuel infrastructure uh, to burn um, natural gas is, is just mind boggling. So I think that um, one of the campaigns really is um, to make sure that none of these speaker plants um, do what NRG proposes to do um, and that all of them be transitioned um, into plants that are either battery storage facilities or are, um, are using clean technology, clean energy. One thing that I will mention and tying this back into racial justice, um, you know, black, brown and, um, and immigrant communities um, often live in the neighborhoods with the highest air pollution. Um, and, you know, these are the neighborhoods often where peaker plants are located. And not surprisingly, and we talked a little bit about COVID and, and, um, and you know, air um, quality, but not surprisingly, these are the same neighborhoods with high rates of asthma and other res respiratory illnesses which makes people more susceptible to viruses like COVID-19. And so, you know, climate justice is also about health equity. Um, another issue that I, I wanna bring up that um, I think is also very important to um, those of us who live in Jackson Heights and, and Elmers, but really, you know, throughout the city, there's something called uh, Local Law 97. Um, it was passed by city council in 2019 as part of a wide ranging um, set of legislation called the Climate Mobilization Act, um, which included seven bills, in, in, including Local Law 97. It was passed um, again in 2019. Um, and essentially Local Law 97 requires the city's big buildings. And what I mean by big buildings um, is um, buildings that are larger than 25,000 square feet uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 40% uh, over the next decade and by 80% uh, by 2050. Um, and so big, these big buildings would be forced um, to cut emissions. Um, and that would be a huge step because it's estimated that about two thirds of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. Transportation is another sector, and I saw there, there was a question about transportation um, that we really need to look at for cutting emissions. But um, bringing it back to big buildings, recently a major obstacle has been um, put in front of Local Law 97, uh, compliments of our good Governor Cuomo. Um, in January, the governor released his uh, proposed executive budget uh, for fiscal year 22, and buried in it is a loophole that would allow these big building owners to essentially get around Local Law 97. Wow. Um, it would allow them to meet their emission targets uh, under Local Law 97 by buying credits for, new, for, for renewable energy uh, produced elsewhere in the state. Um, and, and this is really a slap in the face of activists and elected representatives um, who work so hard to get the legislation passed I mean, really it's shady and it's shameful on the governor's part. And it's essentially a gift to Rebney, uh, the real estate board of New York, which lobbied for this loophole. Um, so it's our job to make sure that this budget item isn't adopted. And you know, that includes again, um, Queens, Jackson Heights, Elmers, it, you know, air quality affects all of us um, and big buildings are uh, such a huge contributor to the air pollution. Um, thankfully, many state legislators including our assembly member um, in Jackson Heights, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, um, is leading the fight against the governor's chicanery, really. Um, so go, Jessica. Um, and so I would encourage uh, uh, everyone on this, um, at, at this meeting, um, if you haven't already, to call the governor uh, and to demand that he remove this loophole and stop serving the interests of powerful real estate corporations. And Shekhar, I just want to mention one thing. I, I know I'm talking a lot right now, but, um, Another thing that's related to Local Law 97 is, um, and also related to uh, racial justice, it's, it's, um, it's very important in the uh, creation of good jobs. So the retrofits that are related to the law um, could create uh, over 140,000 jobs 
across New York City, across the New York City metro area by 2030. Um, so, you know, that's a really important factor in, in it as well. So yes, it is about cutting emissions, these big buildings, um, not getting around this loophole that Governor Cuomo created um, because it's also about um, these good green jobs. I'll stop there. No, thank you so much for mentioning that too and the advocacy work that we need to do. Thoroughly unsurprising uh, that Cuomo would make these exemptions for uh, big buildings uh, and real estate, which is absolutely abhorrent because um, I think as, as Jamie put in the chat too, you know, about 70% of the pollution comes from buildings and especially big buildings as well, um, that <laughs> quite the opposite from being examined should be subject to the strictest regulations, these big landlords and developers. Um, and Jamie, I want to turn to you for a second now. We've talked about a few different measures here, whether it's local law 97 or public power. One thing I want to talk about that you've done a lot of work with um, is a public bank in New York City. Um, and that's something that, you know, in, in our climate justice platform, we've also lifted up to and pointed out. What exactly is a public bank and why is that so important for many of these renewable projects and, and issues that we're talking about? Yeah, certainly. Um, before I even get to public bank, I think it's important to remember that the very beginning of this climate crisis has its roots in racist crimes. Um, and I'm talking of colonization and settler colonialism, as well as the enslavement of African peoples. Um, of course, we've heard of those things, and but but what's really not considered, I feel like, is when, when you steal lands and when you take away people who are indigenous to that land, you are removing that bond and that local knowledge that people have cultivated for generations to really be self-sustainable and really coexist in harmony with the nature that surrounds them. Um, and through this massive and genocidal removal and separation of peoples from their indigenous lands, um, European Western colonies accumulate wealth. And that wealth then becomes the funding, the backbone of all the major industries that our economy is made up of today. Um, and this is really like the birth of big banks and Wall Street banks like JP Morgan Chase. Um, and so what we have now is really just the legacy of that history. So you have industries like fossil fuel that's harming our environment and our communities that's funded by Wall Street, which has roots in the, sla the transatlantic slave trade and settler colonialism. Um, there is the mega real estate developing industries. Um, those are also funded by Wall Street and they are, you know, def they're responsible for deforestation. They're responsible for burning down the Amazon. They're responsible for local scale gentrification here in New York City that we see every day. Um, people facing evictions a year into the crisis, right? So you have the crisis and you have the institutions that enable them. And what we can do here in New York City is identify that and turn them into our targets and eliminate them. And then at the same time, build up alternatives. Um, and a public bank is perhaps like the greatest avenue through which all of the solutions that we are pushing for out of necessity can be realized. Um, we as New Yorkers pay billions of dollars in taxes every year. Um, it's tax season. I'm sure you all are seeing how much you're getting back from the state of New York. And all of that money is held in said Wall Street banks that enable harmful businesses and harmful industries and harmful corporations like Melanie was mentioning, like Arif is mentioning, you know, the local campaigns that we run every day. All of the enemies and targets of our campaigns is funded by Wall Street. And what happens when you hit them in their wallets? Um, well, I would really love to find out by establishing a public bank. Um, and a public bank is really exactly what it sounds like. It is 
the people managing their own public funds. Right now, we're not talking about like me and you walking into a public bank and having our individual checking accounts in that. We're talking about the city of New York and all of the public dollars that the city of New York manages and that being governed by a committee of elected people and other community leaders as opposed to, you know, stake shareholders of a Wall Street like Goldman Sachs that we never know and who has never taken MTA in their entire lives. Like, how are they going to know how to fix the MTA if they don't even take it? Um, so yeah, the campaign for public bank is very much happening right now. Several um, New York City mayoral candidates as well as city council candidates are behind it. And it's both the statewide and a citywide campaign. Um, the statewide bill would enable different municipalities across the state to establish their own bank and then the new york city campaign is to obviously establish one um here because this is the home of wall street um so yeah i'll stop there thank you for that um explanation i think that it's such a to your point it's such a way of uh reclaiming a lot of uh both land value assets that we've uh, lost to corporate greed um, and capitalism um, and predatory capitalism. That's really, to your point, when you talk about these banks and what they've done, um, it's, it goes back to what you, think you said before, how all of these systems are interconnected, right? And it's really just extracting wealth from communities uh, like ours and immigrant communities and, and poor communities of color um, that are suffering from an environmental standpoint because of these practices too. So that's why a public bank I think is so important. I'm glad you explained it. Um, and I know there are some questions coming in um, both uh, through our different platforms. So I wanted to, uh, one of them that just came in was uh, what role does, this is really for everyone, what role does transport policy play in a greener city? So what can we do from a transportation standpoint? Uh, there's a lot uh, that we can do to create a greener city here in New York. Who wants to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll jump on first, I guess, if others want to add in. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, we, there's a few different areas uh, that we need to think about when it comes to transportation, right? It's obviously our uh, mass transit, our trains, right? And how much we need to do to really completely um, refurbish and uh, make it based on renewable uh, uh, energy, our trains to make it far cleaner, right? Our buses too, uh, I think can be far more energy efficient. Uh, and frankly, the combination of those two, plus creating more express, bus lanes or bus ways on, you know, uh, uh, boulevards like Northern Boulevard that are huge uh, polluter boulevards too, um, as well as more uh, protected bike lanes and open space plazas and, and parks, I think are ways to create, while that's not transportation per se, I think the idea is if we think about the modes of transit we use, plus ways that we can allow for more public transit options as well, whether they be bike, buses or trains, uh, and combine that with more greener and open space in our city, I do think we can do a lot more to really make our transportation system far cleaner. Um, I know, Melanie, you had a, uh, a point you wanted to make too. Yeah, I mean, I, I just paused because I was thinking transit policy and that's not what I was looking at, but I did want to offer you, I think it was Bill. It said maybe Bill was the person who asked this question. Um, kind of topic, Bill, good question. <laughs> no, it's all, I mean, it really is all related. And, you know, we saw what happened with Hurricane Sandy, right, when the tunnels flooded and it was down. And I think last time I checked years later, the L tunnel was still being rebuilt. Right. And then they were, it was kind of like in the news a lot. And then it wasn't. And then you're like, is it safe? We don't know. They just kept putting trains through there. And I don't think I, you know, I think we all know like our, our subway system needs a lot of investment. Right. So it's kind of like the grid. It needs a lot of investment. But one of the things that's related to uh, specifically to clean energy that I can comment on is, you know, because I was doing a little bit of following on Hurricane Sandy when I started filming and talking to people about like, well, how can you prevent that from happening? And there's this thing called a microgrid. It's not a new thing. A microgrid just means like a university might have one or a hospital might have one. It means if the rest of the grid goes down, it can island itself off and run independently with like a uh, traditionally, I think often a generator, but solar. In the case of a hurricane, right? It, ha it was happening. It's starting to happen in Puerto Rico after, and, uh, after Hurricane uh, Maria. 
And when I started asking about Hurricane Sandy, a lot of places were looking at microgridding off their, um, uh, like, like different parts of the um, public transportation system. So kind of another piece of this is like the opportunity you see behind me, solar panels. We could stick solar panels in a lot of places in New York City. So um, uh, a, an environmental studies colleague of mine, a professor who, who works with students who study this, had her students do a study or they wanted to do this. Um, if you put solar panels on every platform on the Metro North and the Long Island Railroad and the MTA, right? And I don't know that the number they came to, but if you start to think about how you piece it together sort of from the ground up, like can you make a self-sustaining uh, transit system that can be microgridded off when, and I'm not saying if, I'm saying when, because New York is at you know sea level when there's a flood again, right? So all of these things are like possible, beautiful visions, wonderful, but we need the money, we need the investment, right? So if they are stalling on the MTA, which we know they always do, you know, they, you know, people need to make the, the uh, authorities and the powers that be realize some of these um, possibilities, you know, because they make it safer. So that's sort of tangentially related to transit policy, but it is really about like rebuilding, you know? Absolutely. And I think something that I know, uh, Bill, hopefully that, that sounds like the answer to your question too, but I think it's such an important part of how we make our transit uh, system renewable too. So I'm glad you-, you Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I would just add to that, that in, in 2019, um, the New York State Legislature did pass congestion pricing. Um, and um, that of mm -hmm. course um, was first introduced in the Bloomberg administration and it was defeated. Um, and so um, that's encouraging because um, that would raise, um, you know, a good amount of money for public transportation. Um, and uh, also um, there is a push to um, electrify um, all city um, vehicles and also to, um, to uh, install more charging stations for electric vehicles. So I think transportation bill is critical. And if we are to really make um, um, really significant inroads to reaching uh, the targets um, laid out by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and transportation is obviously a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Arif, absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I had another question for you that I saw uh, come up as well, uh, which is, can you talk a little bit about how programs like, I think you're the best person to this question too, but how programs like composting, um, which are you know community initiatives here um, in our neighborhood, how can they help um, with the larger climate issues that we face as a city too. Um, I think it's a really important point because just to back up for one second, um, the city budget last year cut uh, organic, significantly organics waste uh, recycling in our city, which to me was shocking because not only should we be restoring that, but we should be expanding it far more too. But um, in light of that, can you talk a bit just about um, what, what, why, how is composting a part of it? It seems like such a, you know, it's a small localized program but how does it tie up into the larger climate initiatives we have in our city? Yeah, sure. And I would um, also invite Melanie and Jamie, if you know any more, um, I, please chime in. Um, I, I'm no expert by any measure, but um, you know, obviously food waste um, contributes um, to greenhouse gas emissions. Methane, um, which is far more powerful um, greenhouse gas than carbon, um, is results from, you know, food waste breaking down, releasing into the atmosphere. So um, we really need to prioritize composting. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, as you mentioned, um, the city cut its compost um, program. We never got it in Jackson Heights curbside mm -hmm. pickup. I think um, Sunnyside, Woodside may have had it. Um, and um, th there is a movement to um, really bring it back. We do have some local composting sites, um, and that's great. Um, and I do think actually on the topic of um, community composting, local composting, that, um, you know, uh, the city would do well to invest more in those sites as well, because uh, you know, New York City is obviously too big for um, community compost sites to accommodate all of the food waste. Um, sadly, greenhouse gas emission, um, guzzling vehicles would, will, are, are being used to transport food waste out of the city and produce that compost, right? And so you know, that's why it's another reason why electric vehicles are so important. Uh, but um, it's also a reason why we should look into um, funding and investing in sort of larger scale community compost projects. Some that come to mind are um, Earth Matter. Earth Matter 
um, started out as just a tiny organization um, that mm -hmm. now has a facility on Governor's Island. Um, there's BK Rot um, that is in um, Bushwick, Ridgewood, um, and you know they they accept a lot of food waste. Um, and what that does is also um, helps with hiring local folks to manage these facilities, right? So it's not you know just jobs elsewhere, but jobs in New York City. Um, and with, for BK Rot, they're they're hiring kids to help with the you know production of compost, to help with food scraps pickup, um, give them a livable wage. Um, and so you know compost composting, um, both citywide programs that um, curbside pickup, but also investing in community composting initiatives are very important in the whole sort of formula to address climate change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's through steps, like you said, um, what it does for communities like ours and so many others from a worker standpoint, um, from a uh, environmental standpoint uh, can't be uh, overstated really the way it ties up to the larger environmental policy and I see Bill put a great uh, comment in there too that composting also leads to adding more green space urban trees offset the heat island effect and I think that's absolutely true to think about that as we said before getting more open space park space um, green space uh, and you know on a side note Jackson Heights and Elmhurst rank some of the lowest in New York City when it comes to open green space um, and not only is that an issue of pedestrian safety, of having public space, but it's directly tied to uh, uh, climate justice as well. And I think to your point, that tie between composting, between green space, um, and between larger public health issues, uh, as we saw during this pandemic, having that open space is so critical too. Um, another question we have here um, for, for any of you is really, um, what can we do as a city um, to replace uh, fossil fuel as quickly as possible? Is it, is, it, is it even possible? Can we actually power the whole city with solar panels and wind power. Um, and I think that that question really is a larger point of, you know, how, if we're going to make New York City renewable by 2030, what does that look like from the standpoint of, um, of clean energy? Um, and so, you know, I think addressing some of the big tasks we have ahead of us as a city, this is one of them too. So I'd love to hear, you know, some of your thoughts about that too. All right. I've only spent the last 10 years of my life thinking about this, so I might have a thing or two to oh, yeah, <laughs> So, so that's the big question, right? Can you power all of New York City? And the defeatist response is, no, probably not. So let's not even bother, okay? The progressive response is, you might not do it all overnight, but you certainly are going to do it. So one place I filmed at, if you've been in New York Harbor over by the Ikea and Red Hook, uh, there is a wind turbine. It is New York City's first wind turbine within city limits. That is on a recycling facility. Um, and they also have a really big solar like array on their rooftop. And I asked them, and it's a 24 seven facility. So a lot of these are like industrial facilities, like a lot of industrial facilities have adopted like big rooftop solar. Um, many that I talked to got to 100% of what they make, okay? Of, of the electricity they use and they make from their rooftop solar. This particular one with the wind turbine, he said he got about 20% at the time. Um, this was a couple, you know, several years ago. So um, what's wrong with 20%? It's off of your electric bill. Like once the, the equipment is paid for, you know, there you go. It never, you never have to pay for it again, right? So 20% is actually very good. But I will tell you that, that I heard over and over and over again from large industrial facilities that did make 100% of their energy from uh, either rooftop solar or a combination of solar and uh, wind turbines. So I think we tend to look at it like here's the big metropolis and let's go with a spreadsheet and like calculate it all. And instead, if you start to look at how do I deal with my electrical use? How does my workplace deal with it? Okay, and then you get schools and then you get houses of worship and then you get the municipal uh, facilities um, and like the industrial sites and then you get the transportation, then you get the city buildings and then you actually get sports facilities um, e uh, the, where the Eagles play in Philadelphia and has solar panels on it, okay? So once you start doing that, there's not much left. And then you start adding it from the bottom up. Um, it's a really, really, really long, complicated algorithm how they figure out how much power you need for New York City. Um, but essentially, the, 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 I'm really, really like breaking this down in like a small way, but um, that you have to make almost double the power that we need at any point uh, in time. It's part of like state regulations so we don't have brownouts and things like that. 
if you re, but that's because we're all on one great big grid. And if it goes down anywhere, it goes down everywhere. So if you have something that breaks in the Bronx, it's broken in Brooklyn. Okay. So if you reconfigure it, so there are like micro grids and there are ways where things like uh, critical infrastructure is islanded off and it's not going to go down because something, you know, a tree fell down in Westchester or whatever. Um, then you don't have to, then I think you start to look at how does this city power differently, okay? Because those spreadsheets are based on the calculations of a privately owned corporate power uh, company. You know, they're not based on what I use or what Shaker uses, what Arif uses or Jamie uses or what we need to make our, you know, go about our daily business, right? So the math that's involved is something that, I mean, people will, obviously this is like very debated, um, <laughs> but I did talk to a lot of uh, people who work at utilities, um, you know, who, who also spoke about it like this. Like you just, you know, you're, you're figuring out a different way to do the math and not having, you know, brownouts or blackouts and also predicting. And by the way, I just want to say something about the renewable Rikers and the, the peakers that um, Arif was talking about. So, so the renewable Riker solar farm would replace those peakers, which not only are they like the dirtiest things, right? And they're, they come on when it's the hottest, you know, when we crank our air conditioners, okay? What else is happening on the same day that we crank our air conditioners? Is the sun shining? Okay, so the same time we need them the most, they're very, very productive. Um, so there's a lot of like synergy to like the cycles, you know, and this is, this is again, this is a different kind of math. This is predicting sunshine, which is actually relatively predictable in most places, so. I'm glad you mentioned that, Melanie. I think that's actually a really important point um, and a good point about the uh, uh, ACs too during the, uh, the, the, the summer the, when it's sunny outside. Um, I, looking at the time too, I wanna to be mindful of it. So I, I'd uh, um, give uh, Jamie the last word here um, in terms of uh, when we think about, you've done so much work around racial justice in our city too. So when we talk about really centering communities of color that have suffered for so long um, from environmental racism, and other forms of disinvestment, how do we do that in the climate crisis? I mean, what does it mean to really center them? Is it prioritizing them first? Is it uh, undoing years of, of, of harmful practices? Um, what does that exactly mean? Because I think that's the real work coming out of this. I think we all need to be engaged in. So I'd love to end on that note um, uh, about what that actually means when we think about climate policy. Sorry, is this for me? I just yes. Got um, yeah, I love this question about, you know, can we, I want to return to the other question about like, can we actually power New York City? Um, mm -hmm. Because I want to introduce folks who are not familiar with this concept to the concept of degrowth. Um, so we actually can't globalize this model of consumption habits. If we were to universalize the level at which we use energy in every other country in the globe, we would need the material resources of four Earths. There's only one. Um, so it's not, of course, we should transition out of fossil fuels. Of course, we should turn our energy sources into renewables. However, we cannot continue this level and this is not something that other countries should model, but something that we need to completely restructure before we even tell any other country what to do about climate change. Um, we in the United States use more energy more than any other country. Um, we have cumulatively over the last decades used the most energy. Um, the US military itself is one of the top polluting institutions in the world. Um, we have to scale this down drastically while at the same time building alternative forms. Um, that's, I think, how we really, really address the root cause of this crisis um, and start to address all the different issues that arise and emerge from it, like environmental racism. I, I'm really glad that we can end on that note, Jamie, because I do feel like that's really the work, like you said, too, of really rethinking our responsibility um, as um, a country, as a city, before we started thinking about, you know, 
us lecturing or thinking about setting policies for the rest of the world too when it comes to these issues. Um, and before we, um, I think this was an awesome discussion. Um, and so I wanna thank all of you too uh, for, for coming out. Thank you to our panelists, to Jamie, to Melanie, to Arif. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and giving it both global and local as well. Keeping it local, I just end on one note that Arif just pointed out too, uh, which was a plug for the Queen's Cl uh, Climate Project, which has been doing such amazing work uh, from a composting task force to the campaign to stop the peaker plants um, and to fight for legislation on the state level as well. Please check them out at queensclimateproject.org. Uh, um, they're doing awesome work. And many of them, uh, I saw Meredith here, uh, Meredith is on too, um, or even so many others who are doing such great work in our neighborhoods around these issues. And, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, when we talk about think global, act local, which we kind of said was our uh, uh, theme for tonight too, that's what we mean, right? It's about thinking about these issues on a larger level, but what steps can we take right here in our community uh, to actually fight for a more just, a more green and a more uh, equitable uh, environment um, that's really, as I said before, centering communities that have been harmed by these practices for so long. And so I think QCP is doing that work uh, as are our panelists too, in all different respects as well. So I just wanna thank you all so much for the discussion tonight too. Uh, as I said before, check out our climate justice platform on our website, www.voteshaker.com, where we address a lot of these issues too, uh, and many more as well. Uh, and thank you all so much for, for coming out tonight for a really uh, important discussion too. I appreciate that. Thank you, Millie too, for the shout out. <laughs> and uh, thank you all so much uh, for coming and we'll see you all next week for our next conversation. Thanks, Shekhar. Bye everyone. Thank you all so much.